Dreadball, folks, for those that don't know, Dreadball is a futuristic sports game uh, by Mantic Games, and it is set in the Warpath universe. So those familiar with uh, Warpath and Warpath Firefight, um, if you're familiar with um, Dead Zone, these are the kind of the sci-fi element of Mantic's universes. Dreadball is a sci-fi um, sort of sports game set in that world. Um, if you if you remember, if you're as old as I am, and you remember Speedball 2, or back on the on the Mega Drive and stuff like that, or on the Genesis, um, then you kind of get the idea about what this game is in, in feel and in theme, I think. So basically, each coach, there are two coaches in a game, you're one of them, your opponent is the other one, you field a team, um, the team is six, six players on the field, you have some on the subs bench as well, and the game is played in a series of turns, and these turns are called rushes, um, and during each rush, each coach uh, makes a number of actions, five actions um, generally, although you can get three actions, um, to try and score points and, and kind of and beat your opponent. And you essentially win the game by either getting a landslide victory, which is scoring seven points. It's not as easy as it sounds, and I'll come on to that in a bit. Or by, at the end of 14 um, turns or 14 rushes, basically being the person who has the most points. So that's the kind of the general kind of background of the game. So let's start by sort of talking about what you need to play the game. So you will need, if you've never played before, I would recommend you start with the Dreadball 2nd Edition Core Box. And in this Core Box, it has everything that you need to start playing. There's a, a double-sided gaming board. The other side is for Dreadball Ultimate. Let's ignore that for tonight. I don't want to complicate things. But basically, you, you get a game board with the Dreadball pitch in it. You get the, the second edition collector's rule book. You get the quick start guide, which if you've never played before, I think is really good. It essentially talks you through a kind of like a couple of turns and then basically says, right now, finish the game with like a pre-set up board. I, f I think it's really useful if you've never played before. Um, it comes with 12 plastic Yindage players, which are called the nine, uh, sorry, the ninth moon tree sharks. It comes with a Yindage captain as well. It comes with 12 plastic Neobot players, which are the Draconis All-Stars. So these are the two teams that you get inside. As you can see there, you're getting like um, 13 models for each team. So for all, there's only six on the field at any time. You have subs on the subs bench as well. Uh, there's a, a plastic um, Neobot captain. There's a ref bot, so the game has a referee as well. There is a, a plastic rush tracker and trophy score tracker. We'll come on to that stuff in a bit. There's um, actually the actual balls that you need to play, like sort of like get thrown about the fit, uh, the pitch. Um, we've also got 54 Dreadball game cards. We've got team cards, stat cards, and there's captain cards. There's plastic counters, not cardboard. There's actually plastic ones in there. And you also get 18 colored dice. So if you've never played before, you and a friend, or during lockdowns, you and a, you and a family member want to play a Dread Ball, the Core Box is a great way to start. If you're going to be playing with somebody in the future who already has the Core Box, and you want to just get in the cheapest way, the cheapest way to get in is just pick up a team that you like the look of. The basics of the game. So this, what you can see on the screen now, is a Dread Ball pitch. And as you can see, it works on a hex grid. So along the top, I don't know how small it is on your particular screen, but along the top, just above the pitch, you will see a track which starts from 7 at one side, gets to 0 in the middle, and gets to 7 at the other side. And this is the score tracker. Now, unlike most sports games, where basically if you score 3 points, you go 3-0, and then your opponent scores 3 points, it goes 3-3, three, three, this works on a different mechanic. This works on like a tug-of-war mechanic. So if you score 3 points... The tracker moves along the track to your side to number three. And then if your opponent scores three points, the tracker moves back to the zero position. So it's constantly push-pull all, all along the time. So that's why it's more difficult than it sounds to score seven points, because you have to have seven clear points in order to get a landslide victory. And it, psychologically as well, it's quite interesting because you never feel like you're really out of the game because you're not just trying to catch up your opponent you're actually pulling them back from the victory, which I think is psychologically, it, it's quite uh, it's quite clever actually how it works. If you're familiar with God Tier, it, this works in a similar manner, although Dreadball did it first, to be fair. So below the main pitch, you can see along the, the bottom there, it basically has a track which runs from 0 all the way to 14, and these are the, the rush counters, if you like. So basically, um, you'll see one is white, one is red, one's white, one's red, all the way along. 
So there's 14 turns in the game, but each coach, like each kind of like player, me and you, if you like, um, has seven turns each. So I have a turn, you have a turn, until we've each had seven, which takes it to 14. You'll see in the top right and the bottom left corners, these are like the subs bench and the sin bin. Um, these are areas where basically if a player gets injured and they get taken out for two turns, and um, we'll talk about that stuff later, they basically get placed in the little slot that says two, and then at the, the next sort of rush that you have, you move it down to one until eventually they kind of like recover and come back on as subs. You'll see right across the middle is the main playing area, and down the centre strip, this is basically the centre of the of the of the pitch. This is where the the dread ball is launched in from either the top or, or the bottom of the pitch at the at the start of the game, and every time there's been a, a, a strike, basically the ball comes straight back in from the side, and the game doesn't never reset. It's not like I've scored a goal, right? Blow the whistle, everybody goes back to the starting lineup. Whenever a goal is scored or a strike is scored. Basically, the ball just kind of gets whipped back in from the side of the pitch and you carry on from wherever you are. Um, you'll also see those kind of the, the white hexes and the red hexes. These are the strike zones and these are where you score. So, the hex on the right hand side, there is the strike hex. This is the hex you want to throw the ball into when you're wanting to score. The, uh, what's that? Two, four, five, six, the seven, and the seven hexes in the center. Good maths. Um, these are the ones where you have to be standing to be able to throw the ball into the strike hex. If you can't throw them from any of the sort of surrounding hexes, it has to be from these red strike hexes. So the ones in the center there are where you can kind of throw from. Right on the far left hand side, you have what's called a bonus hex. You can throw from here as well. Um, however, it is more difficult. And because it's more difficult, you get an extra point if you score from that hex. So it's more difficult because of the distance, basically. So what you'll do is, the, um, basically, if I can go back to the pitch there, you'll see the two sort of strike hexes that are just to the left and right of that centre pitch. You will score one point from scoring for a normal hex. If you're on the bonus hex, you'll score two points. And the strike hexes that are right, right at the far left and the far right, um, you will score three points for scoring from one of them hexes or you'll score four points if you're standing on the bonus hex. So you can see how the game can swing backwards and forwards very quickly. Your opponent can get one point. I thought something flashed behind me there. Your opponent can get one point, uh, and then you can go up and basically and score four points and drag it all the way back up the air, the pitch. So it makes a big difference. You need to know about the teams now. So these are some of the stats. So here we can see an example stat, stat line for the Forge Fathers team. The Forge Fathers team, for those that don't know, are the Dwarves. And this particular team is called the Midgard Delvers. Now, players-wise on your team, there are three different types of player. You have a Guard, you have a Jack, and you have a Striker. Now, Guards are basically, they're, they're stronger and they're more heavily armoured. So you can, as you can imagine, they're the ones that's going to be smashing into, into your opponent's players and knocking them flying. But they don't wear the special dread ball gloves which allow you to throw and catch the ball, so they can't throw and catch. Uh, jacks are basically like a jack of all trades. They're, um, they're pretty good. They're flexible. They're pretty good at most things, but not really a specialist at anything. Um, and strikers are agile and skillful. Um, but with that agility comes less armor, so they need to be protected, basically. So they, they get bonuses um, for their agility tests. Just give me one second. There's a bulb just popped over here, and it's very smelly. I want to turn it off. Excuse me. Ooh, that's my that's my my hobby bulb <laughs> just popped there. Whew, it's a bit stinky. Excuse me about that one. Right. Um. Where are we up to there? Yes. You can also recruit captains to your team as well, and MVPs or most valuable players. Um. But they still have these particular um types as well. Now, the stats themselves are actually pretty sort of self-explanatory. Uh, as you can see, if I can just make this a bit bigger on my screen, um, you can see move down the left-hand side. This is how many hexes that your player can move. You then have strength, agility, speed, skill, and armor. Um, these relate to different tests that you do during a game, but the number there is basically um, the, the kind of, <coughs> excuse me, the number that you need to achieve or exceed to succeed in that test. Oh, that smells it about my throat. Next up is the cost. This is how much it costs you to hire <clears throat> one of those particular models to your, arm, uh, to your team. And then you basically have below that 
how many starting dread ball cards and starting coaching dice you start the game with. So um, dread ball cards will come on to later. Coaching dice are essentially like um, like a, an extra dice that you can add to a dice pool to try and improve your chances. Um, yes, you, so basically you, each coach gets five actions to take each turn and you can use up to two actions on any one player. So it's not like you can just put all five actions onto one of your players and it can kind of rambo up the pitch. You can only put a maximum of two actions onto each, uh, onto each player. So we're talking about actions now. Actions, some of the main actions that you can take are run, sprint, stand up, slam, throw and steal. And these are relatively self-explanatory. Run is a normal move. Um, if you remember from the stats, basically I think um, I think it was a striker can uh, they can all move four four hexes as it was. Basically, that's what your move is. That's how many um, hexes you can move. Um, sprint basically is means you can you can move double your normal run action. However, you can kind of you have to do this in a straight line. And if you move, sort of, if you rotate, like, sort of, to another facing, that is classed as a move action as well. So, basically, it's really good for, for running really fast in straight lines, but because you're kind of sprinting, you have to slow down to basically turn, which takes away from your kind of your move actions, if you like. Stand up is just getting back up if you've been slammed prone. Slam is kind of your main attack action. You can use this to move your opponents out of the way. You can even use this to kind of to, to knock down your opponents and injure them or potentially even take them out of the game completely. Throw is the way you're going to move the ball around the pitch. You can throw it to, to players and, and then uh, make catch tests as well. And then steal is basically where you can literally get next to your opponent and steal the ball out of their hands. There's some extra actions and things in the game as well. I won't go into everything in full detail, but there's things like fouls, which you can do. You can evade. So if you're in a hex next to an opponent and you want to move away, you can do evade moves. And you can do things like dash, which is kind of like pushing your look a little bit. When you get to the end of your move action, you want to just kind of push at that extra hex or extra couple of hexes. But you don't need to know that stuff, basically, for what I'm just talking about tonight. Um, and yeah, you can get some free actions for playing certain cards which we'll come on to later or if you double successes as well which we'll come on to later in order to achieve things like slamming and throwing you basically perform what are called skill tests now this is where you roll an amount of dice um, in order to match or to exceed the stat that's required so as an example you always start with a three dice pool so these numbers that you see on the screen are never modified basically you so if, if i use the which one we're going to talk about here. I think we're going to talk about a striker throwing for a strike. So throwing um, is um, is a skill test. It takes a lot of skill to be able to throw the ball. So the skill test here shows that is a 4+. plus. It will always be a 4+, plus, but the modifiers will either add or take away the number of dice you get to roll. So as I said, it's a skill test. You need a single 4+, plus to, to, uh, to succeed. The strike hex is classed as a small target. So you lose one dice from that three dice pool, taking you down to two. If you're standing on the bonus hex as well, um, then at the, because of the distance being further away, this makes it harder again. So basically, uh, this takes your two dice pool down to a one dice pool now. So now you're only rolling one dice on a four plus to succeed. Now, this is the point where you can use um, things like coaching dice as well to try and, um, to try and help. It's also worth noting that rolling a six is an exploding six. So this means that if you roll a six uh, and six comes up, you, you basically roll an extra dice and you can keep rolling dice as long as you keep rolling sixes. Uh, and it's important because you only need one success to uh, achieve the strike. However, if you double the amount you need, so if you only need one and you get two successes, this is classed as doubling your success and it will trigger something called a fan check. Uh, and we'll come on to fan checks in a little moment because we're going to talk about cards now. So as, you, as I mentioned at the start, there's a deck of 54 cards in there, which is full of action cards and special cards. Um, and basically, these are used to give you bonuses during the game. Um, here we can see an action card, which basically grants any player any free action. So if you've basically... Um, if you've done a couple of actions with one of your players, but you're not quite where you want to be yet. So, for example, you might have um, 
sort of you might have moved, you might have slammed, and then you want to throw the ball afterwards. You could play this card to do a third action on a normal player. Um, you've also got another card here, which is a special card. It says worse for wear, and you can play this one to cause an opposing player to suffer negative one to their dice tests. So there's some cards will benefit you, and some cards will like negatively impact your opponent as well. Uh, and at the beginning of each rush, you draw the number of cards indicated on your team stat. So for the dwarf team here, it would be one card. So um, there's no limit to how many cards you can hold in your hand. Um, and you can also spend an action to draw a card. Now you might be thinking, well, why would I want to waste an action to draw a card? One reason would be if you're going to score with with them um, if you're about to throw the ball and score a strike hopefully score a strike once you score it's the end of your rush now if you've still got two or three i am actions uh, action tokens you want to use and you don't want to waste them you can always spend them to buy a card now the reason you might want to buy cards is because obviously they give you different special abilities and things but you can also spend a card to buy a coaching dice so there's reasons why you might want to do those kind of things now, fan checks I mentioned before, if you do some spectacular things, like if you if you injure a player and take them out of the game, if you double a success when throwing a strike, if you score from a bonus hex, these are all things that send the crowd uh, going wild. And this will cause a fan check. And essentially a fan check is you will pick up the top card from this deck, and you'll see in the bottom right-hand corner there's a little red dot. And what you'll do is you'll take this card, you'll put it to one side in your sort of fan check area, and when you have enough of those little red dots to add up to three, you can trade those three cards, those three dots in, if you like, the other cards. You can trade them in either for a coaching dice or a card to be put into your hand as well. So this is another way where you can get extra coaching dice to help you out. It's another way where you can get extra cards into your hand, which have some great abilities like, like giving you extra actions. Now, it might be that when you first play this for the first time, you might decide to not play with the cards. I certainly didn't for my first couple of games. But I would suggest that once you get your head around the rules, definitely please do include them. That essentially is the basics to how you will kind of sort of play, um, how you'll play Dreadball. The only things I've maybe not mentioned is there is a referee in the game and the referee can kind of keep an eye on things. He's watching out for fouls and stuff like that. Um... And it's, it's a brilliant game for both competitive play, if you're into that kind of stuff. There were some great tournaments um, sort of for this game before, before COVID hit. Uh, and it's also great if you're in a bit of a league with, uh, with local players as well. So when, when we get back to being able to play games, this is a great game for that. And as I mentioned before, a team has roughly about, about 12 or 13 players in it, something like that. So you're not painting up a lot of models. Um, it's a perfect little kind of hobby project to paint up a nice little small team and just get it, get it to the table quickly. Thanks for watching my video. I hope that you really enjoyed it. And if you did, why not consider clicking on the suggested video below to see more of the work that I've done. If you'd like to support the long-term sustainability of this channel, why not consider checking out my Patreon where you can pledge in support from as little as $2 a month and there is lots of different tiers and bonuses which will give you access to a private Discord server. It will give you free t-shirts, free mugs, a podcast every month and a number of other things including getting your name at the end of every video like these awesome folks who already support me now.